And welcome to the Tom Hartman University Book Club. Today we're reading an excerpt from Robert Wolf's book, Original Wisdom, Stories of an Ancient Way of Knowing. I wrote the foreword for it. Uh, Robert Wolf just died just a few months ago, just this last year, uh, in Hawaii. Louise and I visited him there a number of times. He was in his 90s. And back in the 1950s, he was an anthropologist and sociologist who had been hired by the Malaysian government to figure out why this one particular aboriginal tribe, the Sanoi, who lived deep inside the jungle, hunting-gathering tribe, why they were, quote, lazy, why they were unwilling to work in the rubber plantations. And he got to know them, and he discovered that their view of the world was completely different than ours. And that's essentially what this book is about, and it's absolutely a mind-boggling book. I'll share a little. This is from the middle of the book. This is page 86. It's uh, finally he's reached the point where they'll let him sleep in the village with them. And he says, in time, I grew to know them better. But it was when I began to overnight in their villages that I learned that they literally lived in another reality. When it became dark, people huddled together for warmth and companionship. In the tropics, there's no long period of dusk. It grows dark quickly. The air would become cool and people would move closer together, reaching out, touching a neighbor, perhaps holding hands. Women might run their fingers through the hair of the person sitting next to them. During the nights I stayed over, they would often gather around me and have me ask them questions. Then they would ask me questions very quietly and softly. Our being together was not like other social situations I'd ever experienced. We talked, but softly. They did not know how to compete for attention. A few words now and then were all that were spoken, a question or a comment, a simple answer, long silences. Sometimes someone would have some tobacco and light a cigarette, a tobacco rolled into a leaf, which was passed around the group. People might ask each other whether they had noticed that particularly bright patch of sunlight on the side of the river behind a certain tree, or if they had noticed that large yellow bird that sang in the morning. Evening was a time of reflection, of gentle communication, of being together. I never knew their blood relationships, but evening times felt like family. As it grew later, one of the people would get up to go, go into one of the houses, more often little more than lean-tos or rickety huts on stilts, and fall asleep. Eventually, each of us had found an empty spot on the floor of one of the shelters, and wrapped in our sarongs, we huddled close to whoever else slept in that house that night. The houses did not belong to anyone. It seemed that each of the four or five little shelters was for all the people living in, this, in that settlement at that moment. We would fall asleep whenever we chose, and, I'm sure, with whomever we wanted to spend the night. Yes, people had sex, but even that was gentle, quiet, and discreet. Occasionally, someone might turn over and bump into a couple being a little too acrobatic or noisy, and there would be a grunt. Or people might move away from a couple that made too much, about, too, too much to do about their lovemaking. Passionate young making, lovemaking between young people often took place during the day, outside in a more hidden spot in the jungle, I was told. In the morning, we might not all wake up at the same time, but those who woke up early would lay quietly, waiting for more people to awaken. And somehow, as if by magic, we would find ourselves sitting in a circle, rubbing our eyes, stretching the kinks out. One person would say, I saw a bird, a beautiful bird. Someone else would say, yes, I too saw a bird. What kind of bird was it, another would ask. And so they would create a story with images from our dreams. They did not think that they were sharing dreams as we think of dreams. The Sinai believed that the world we live in is a shadow world and that the real world is behind it. At night, they believe, we visit the real world. In the morning, we share what we saw and learned there. The story that was created around the memories that four or five people brought back from the real world set the tone for that day. Sometimes one of the group would take the lead in soliciting input from each person in the room. How about you? What do you remember? Other times, the story flowed without help. A few times, no story emerged at all. It was very obvious that when a more or less coherent story was created around the images we shared, we who had slept in that shelter would live that story that day. Usually the stories were simple. A bird had shown the way to a tree that was bearing fruit. Later that day, some of us would find that tree, and of course it did have ripe fruit. Or the story was about a bad storm, so people would stay close to the shelters all day, and yes, there was a big storm in the late afternoon. Occasionally the stories were about things that affected all of them, all the people in the settlement, or perhaps even all the Sinai. In that case, they would make it a point to share with the people who had slept in other shelters as soon as possible. It might take all morning to disseminate that story to everyone. I did not witness any attempts to call a meeting, but it was obvious that when a serious story came out of a morning's dream telling, all the people in the settlement would eventually hear that story.
I learned about all of this during very early during the time that I spent with the Sonoy. It was in what I thought of as the first village, the first settlement I visited, that an important story emerged from what I brought back from the real world during one of my nights there. It made a big impression on me because part of the story came from my dream. It was a particularly vivid dream about one of my family's dogs, an all-black mongrel that seemed to have come with the house we rented in the suburbs of Kuala Lumpur. We had tried to get rid of that dog. In fact, one of the first days after we moved off uh, in, we had run over to the over the poor dog in the driveway, but he would not leave. We tried chasing him away. He kept coming back. So we adopted him and called him Jaga, which is Malay for guard or protector. I do not remember that Jaga was a particularly good watchdog, but he was around. And he goes on to tell his dream. And then it, it's a, just an absolutely fascinating story. Original Wisdom, Stories of an Ancient Way of Knowing by Robert Wolfe.